everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for another talk with Yale Center Beijing. Um, uh, first things first, um, thank you for joining us. My name is Devin Lau. I'm the Associate Director of Yale Center Beijing, uh, and we're glad to have you join us. Uh, if this is your first time joining us for an online uh, talk with Yale Center Beijing, uh, we've been hosting many of uh, different Yale professors across the different fields um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and we've done everything from art history to uh, biology uh, to economics and philosophy. And so we're very excited to have uh, Professor Marla Giha today uh, give us a talk on astronomy, which of course, with all the recent uh, images being sent in, um, and you know, we've been able to see things that we've never been able to see before, literally. Um, and so it's uh, great um, to have somebody join us who can actually explain to us what, what's going on um, and why we should be so excited. Um, and so we have a very interesting talk today on the Milky Way, dwarf galaxies, and dark matter. Um, I will introduce our speaker and then turn it over to her. So Professor uh, Marla Giha is Professor of Astronomy and Physics at Yale University, as well as Director of Yale Telescope Resources. She uses the world's largest telescopes to study the universe's smallest galaxies. Um, in understanding how the smallest known galaxies form, she uses these galaxies to understand the nature of dark matter and the underlying cosmology of the universe. She obtained her bachelor's in applied and engineering physics from Cornell University and her PhD in astrophysics from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And she's of course received various honors, uh, including an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and most recently was awarded a Dylan Hickson Prize for Teaching Excellence in the National Sciences at Yale. Um, so we're very lucky to have her join us um, and um, I will turn it over to her. Awesome, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be able to speak with you. And it's so cool to see a lot of kids. I wanna say hi to you guys. I just dropped my seven-year-old son at school. Um, and so um, I definitely welcome questions, but I definitely welcome questions from kids as well. Um, let me get started. So I'm excited to chat with you about um, small little galaxies around our Milky Way. And there's been so much happening really even, you know, just in the last couple of weeks um, in this field. And so what I want to do is kind of guide you through why the field has become super exciting. Um, I will also end with um, some data from the James Webb Space Telescope. I was actually down in Baltimore where um, they actually control the telescope, and I had the honor of going to the control room itself. I, it was like a fan. It was super exciting. Um, and so I will explain how the James Webb Space Telescope connects um, to small galaxies around um, our Milky Way. But first, let me kind of uh, give everyone a bit of a tour of the Milky Way so that we all have the same images in our heads when I talk about this. So. This is an image, not of the Milky Way, but of what we think our Milky Way galaxy looks like. So this is an image of the Andromeda M31 galaxy. It's our nearest neighbor, nearest large neighbor. Um, and we think the Milky Way looks pretty similar. Uh, we, the sun, the planets, and everything we have ever, most of the stars that you see in the night sky are all in a fairly small region, just the tip of that arrow. Um, out in the outskirts of the Milky Way. We're about three quarters of the way out from the center. Uh, most of the stars that are forming in the Milky Way are formed in a disk, um, sort of a disk of stars. And if we could see this image kind of tip it over, um, that disk of stars that the Milky Way, uh, that the sun in the, the solar system uh, is in is actually quite thin. And if you are in a region where you had very dark skies, which most of us are not, um, but if you travel somewhere that you can see the night sky well, you can actually prove to yourself that the Milky Way is a disk of stars by just looking up the Milky Way, the sort of white glow that you can see overhead is where you are looking into the disk of the Milky Way where there's lots of stars. And on either side, you're looking above or below the plane of the Milky Way. For the purpose of, of this talk, I'm actually interested in two things uh, in this image. There are this one and this one. So these two regions right here and here are galaxies in their own right. They are small galaxies. These two happen to be about a tenth the mass of the Milky Way. 
And we are now realizing that the Milky Way has uh, many tens of these satellite galaxies, and they are super important for helping us understand both how galaxies form, but also the cosmology of the universe and what is the nature of the mass in the universe. So in order to explain why these small galaxies are so important, I'm gonna try and show you a movie. Um, this movie is going to be of, a, it's a numerical simulation of starting around the beginning of the universe and uh, going through time until roughly present day. And we're gonna focus on the, the formation of the Milky Way. And I'm gonna cross my fingers that this movie plays. It only happens like half the time. And if it doesn't, we will uh, adjust. So let's see how it goes. Ooh, it's gonna play, fabulous. So this is a movie of the formation of the Milky Way. And what you can see is that there are lots of small things kind of hanging around. And occasionally one of those small things will crash into the center and merge with the larger object. And so we are slowly building up structure that will eventually form today's Milky Way. This is the process of, it's called hierarchical galaxy formation. That is small things merge to create bigger and bigger things. And so our Milky Way was made out of hundreds if not thousands of smaller galaxies. And so that same image, if I then show you where um, that image I showed you in the first slide is, the stars in the Milky Way form kind of right in the center of this structure. And then there's a prediction from this theory that there should be hundreds if not thousands of objects left over from this process that are satellite galaxies, small galaxies that haven't yet merged into the Milky Way's environment. And here is where the problem lay. So this is now 10 years ago, 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago. We only knew of 11 satellite galaxies. So this is 2000, about 2005. And if you had talked to me then, um, I would have said, oh yeah, only 11 galaxies, maybe we're missing one or two, um, but uh, definitely not more. And at the time, this was called very creatively the missing satellite problem. That is, we were predicting many satellites around the Milky Way. We only knew of a handful. However, since 2005, the number of satellites has increased dramatically. So here is a, a graph, a plot. Uh, this is as a function of time. So this is year on the bottom. So this is 100 years ago. You can, and this is the number of satellites known around the Milky Way. And so here we are right here at 2005, you know, kind of whatever. And then all of a sudden something happened and the number of galaxies shot up. And then there was a little pause. And then another galaxy shot up again. At this point, and this plot is about half a year out of date. Um, there were just four more galaxies discovered in a paper last week. Um, and so what's going on? Like why, first of all, how do we miss these things? They were so important. How could we have missed them? And what is happening that we are finding them now? So what we'll do is go through each of these sort of three stages and explain how galaxies were found. So first of all, let's just talk about how galaxies were found before 2005. And so here is an, uh, this is actual data of stars in the sky. This data is amazing. This is coming from the Gaia telescope. Um, it's a space telescope launched by the Europeans um, looking at individual sky stars in the Milky Way. And what you can see are these two things right here. Um, these are the two brightest satellites around the Milky Way. These are the Magellanic Clouds. If you are in the Southern Hemisphere, you can actually see these with your naked eye. Um, so here is just a beautiful image. Uh, I I'm not even sure where this is from. Is this, I think this is in Australia. Um, these are two, uh, the two galaxies here are the Magellanic Clouds. These are the two brightest galaxies, satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. So they were found by visual searches. And in fact, the other nine galaxies that were found prior to 2005 were also found via visual searches. So these were found by photographic plates of people just looking through and scanning for something that looked like a galaxy. And so here is an image um, for one of the more faint, uh, oops, sorry, uh, one of the more faint galaxies found by visual searches. But when you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, definitely a galaxy sitting right there. And so that was the state of the art until 2005. And what changed in 2005 um, was that we were able to use digital 
cameras and digital images to fully map the sky. And so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was, uh, is still a, a collaboration of thousands of astronomers across the whole world um, that have been mapping the sky systematically. And we're able now to use different techniques to find galaxies. And so let's talk for a second about what I mean by digital mapping. The technology and indeed the camera that's used in uh, digital mapping and basically all astronomy cameras at this point is actually the same as in uh, your phone. So, you know, in your camera phone, you have a, a detector. It has a bunch of little plastic lenses and there is a detector right there, very similar to what we use in astronomy. There's one big difference is that in astronomy, our detectors are just slightly bigger. Um, and so here is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey camera. Um, you know, it's about a foot wide, um, which would be hard to put in your in your pocket. Um, the iPhone, the most recent iPhone, I don't have one, but um, I looked it up, is about 12 megapixels. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey camera is 120 megapixels, but this was built in 1998, right? And so the technology is similar, it's just on a different scale and is also slightly more expensive. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey surveyed most of the sky and the part of the sky that it surveyed um, up until 2010 is in sort of grayish regions. And you can see the, what are these? Maybe blue, light blue dots. These are the galaxies that were found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. However, if I show you an image of these, you can't actually see the galaxy in this. So let's kind of zoom in on this. So this is an image of where a galaxy found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is. But the problem is that most of the bright things that you see in this image are actually foreground stars in the Milky Way's disk. And so imagine we are looking through the disk of the Milky Way out to a galaxy a little bit farther past us. Most of the bright stars are foreground stars, and we can't tell the difference um, necessarily between these just by an image, but what we can do is digitally remove the foreground stars. And so we can identify stars that are in the foreground based on their color and their brightness. And if I remove those stars, this is what I see. And so these are the same images, except that I have removed the things that I think are in, in the foreground in front of me. So you can kind of see it, but definitely, you know, it's it would hard to be hard to tell without being able to do this digitally. And so all of the galaxies that were found in this sort of blitz of, of um, activity were found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So you can imagine if we have a little blip here and then there's another boost, this must be some kind of technology change. And indeed, these galaxies between 2018 to 20 were found in the Dark Energy Camera Survey. Um, this is a camera that was installed, again, now about 10 years ago. This camera had a huge detector, 520 megapixels. Um, and the same kind of techniques where we digitally remove foreground stars um, was did that, what happened in that survey. The gray region, region here is the region that that survey has surveyed, and we found a whole bunch more satellites. Now, you know that there seem to be more red points, sort of like the density of red points um, is higher here than in other regions. This survey was a little bit deeper. It got images that were a little bit um, more sensitive. And so you can imagine now uh, thinking about how many satellites should be around the Milky Way. We can start to realize that maybe there are regions of the sky we haven't surveyed. Maybe there are regions that uh, we haven't gone deep enough. And so here coming back, Although we know of 60 satellites around the Milky Way, we actually can do some corrections for our incompleteness. And we think that there should be something like 200 or 250 satellites around the Milky Way. Um, we hope many of those will be found in the next couple of years. There is a new telescope that will come online in the next couple of, within the next year called the Rubin Observatory. The Rubin Observatory, excuse me, the Rubin Observatory has a 3.2 gigapixel camera. Um, it will take not only a digital, digital image of the full sky, it will take a digital image of the full sky every two days over 10 years. And so we'll actually have a digital movie of the sky. 
Um, so we're really excited about that. I just was looking at my email this morning and the camera, this 3.2 gigapixel camera is just about to be, um, to go online, to be placed in the telescope itself, which is really exciting. So this is how these objects were found. However, from just images, these are candidate galaxies. And so you can see here, there's red dots and open circles. And so it says confirmed versus candidate. When we do this search for these galaxies, we call them candidate galaxies. So here you might say, well, look, you have a bunch of stars. They seem to be you know, in the same place in the sky, but how do you know this isn't just random? That is, there aren't stars that, you know, they just happen to be moving all over the place and you just caught them at a very um, special time when they all happen to be near each other. And if you waited a little while, maybe they would move and, and disperse. And so the answer, and this is really where most of my group's work um, is focused, is we need to measure the velocity or the speed of these stars to figure out, first of all, do they all have the same speed? That is, are they all gravitationally associated with each other? And as a bonus, we can actually figure out the mass of those galaxy, uh, of that galaxy by looking at the relative speed of stars. So let's kind of talk about that in a little bit more detail. So let me explain why we need to get the speed of stars in order to tell if it's um, associated. And I'll try and do this with a, a cartoon. I, I think this works okay, but hopefully I'll be able to explain it slowly. So here, imagine that we are um, sitting on Earth and we are in the Milky Way. So here we are, you know, let's like say the sun is right here in the Milky Way. And we are looking through the Milky Way out to, let's say, this galaxy, which we call Segway 1. Um, the name of galaxies, it's really a terrible convention. So Segway is the name of the survey that the galaxy was originally found in. So the survey was called Segway. So here we are, we're looking through the Milky Way to stars in this galaxy. And so here are, let's say the, the sun is here, we look through the Milky Way's disk out to a dwarf galaxy, out to a small galaxy, which has a collection of stars here. And so you imagine, you know, we're looking through the Milky Way um, to stars that are in this galaxy. And if we get an image, you know, we just get an image of a bunch of these stars. Maybe one or two are actually stars in the Milky Way's disk. Maybe a handful are stars in the galaxy. But from the image alone, we can't tell which star is which. However, the stars in the Milky Way are moving all together around the Milky Way itself. So the stars are all moving with one speed. The dwarf galaxy, so let's call that yellow. So they're all moving with this yellow speed. The dwarf galaxy is moving in a different direction. And all those stars are moving in a direction. And we'll say that's the red direction. And so if I get an image, I can't tell. But if I get uh, able to measure the, the speed of each of these stars, then instead of the image, I can get a velocity, a speed. And now it's really obvious, right? I have some yellow stars. Oh, those must be in the foreground. I have some red stars, those must be part of the galaxy. And if they're all moving with the same speed, those stars in the dwarf galaxy are moving together. And so they must be associated with each other. So now the next question is, okay, how do you measure the speed of a star? How do you measure the velocity of a star? And to do that, we need to get the spectrum, a spectrum of a star. So here is a spectrum. The, when I say spectrum, what I mean is just take the light of the star, let it go through, let's say, a prism or a grating that disperses the light as a function of wavelength. And you'll notice here that you have a very beautiful rainbow. So I've, I've split the star's um, light from red out to you know, green, red, purple. And you'll notice these dark lines. These dark lines are due to chemical elements, different chemical elements in the atmosphere of the star. And because uh, the uh, chemicals and atoms and, and molecules um, have are quantized, they steal light at very specific points in the spectrum, it's very specific points in wavelength. These different lines, we know exactly where they should be um, and we know um, exactly what wavelength they should be. When a star is moving, those stars are all 
going to be shifted at the same way in the same way. This is a Doppler shift. So all the stars are uh, the stars moving. All the lines will be shifted in the same direction, and we can measure a velocity for that particular star. So this pattern of line shifts as the star is moving, um, and we can tell whether it's moving away for us or uh, towards us. This is a Doppler shift, um, and so that is all the stars are moving because all the lines are moving because the star is moving. And so we can figure out the, the velocity of each one of these stars by getting a spectrum. So we can tell if this is a random collection or not by measuring the speed. So really, let me change that to say, we'll get the spectrum of each star. And so in order to do this, we need to go to a telescope to get a spectrum of a star. I am super lucky at Yale, I am able to have access to a fantastic telescope in order to measure spectra. Um, so the Keck 10 meter telescope in Hawaii is the biggest optical telescope in the world. Um, Yale has access to 20 nights per year on this telescope. Um, I, as director of telescopes, um, I, we write proposals. So everyone at Yale is allowed to write a proposal to get time on this telescope. I often will get a night or two per year on this telescope. Um, each of those nights, I, I just work really hard for about a month before um, in order to schedule exactly every minute of that time for that night. Um, usually, I will control the telescope at, at, from New Haven, um, so I'll do it remotely. Um, once in a while, um, I can go out to Hawaii to do things there, but most of it's done remotely. So what I do is I, um, that one night per year, I will get spectra of individual stars in these candidate galaxies and search for these absorption lines in the spectrum. So here is a little piece of data. Um, I not only get one spectrum per time, I usually get a hundred spectra um, per exposure, per, um, per observation. And so what you're looking at here, each one of these vertical lines um, is a spectrum of a star. All these other horizontal lines that look kind of annoying um, are lines from the atmosphere itself. So our atmosphere is glowing and it glows at particular wavelengths. I have a lot of software that I've written to get rid of those lines. And so here, if I plot the, um, the brightness of the line going up in this direction, here the black and red lines are a little bit of that, um, that data. And these dips in that line, those three dips, are dark lines due to a particular chemical element. In this case, these are three lines from calcium. And those lines are shifted just slightly from where I would have expected them um, uh, if they were not moving. And so what I'm able to do is measure their velocity. And so here I come back to my image. I can now measure the velocity um, of those stars. And as a bonus, if I can measure the relative velocities of those stars, I can measure the mass of this galaxy. OK, so let's talk about that. So here is um, a little plot. I've got the velocity of each individual star in this image. Um, so most of the stars that are in the Milky Way um, are they have a velocity that's very similar to the sun. So a star that's in the Milky Way would be moving with the sun, and so it wouldn't have much of a relative difference in how much it's moving. So we think these stars between zero, zero and about 100 kilometers a second are associated with the Milky Way. And then all of a sudden we have this huge spike of stars at a velocity that's well beyond what the Milky Way stars should have. They all have very similar velocity. So they are all moving together with the same velocity. And from the width of this distribution, from the, the change in different velocities here, I can measure the mass of that galaxy. So you can imagine if a galaxy was really massive, the stars would be moving with some um, relative motion. The, the, if they're moving really fast, there has to be mass that's kind of holding them together. If the stars are moving a little bit slower, that means there isn't as much mass to hold them together. If, the, if there was no, if there was a lot of mass, the stars would fly off in a different direction. And so we can measure the mass, the dynamical mass, that is the mass that I infer from how fast the stars are moving relative to each other. And the crazy thing, uh, so those are the Milky Way stars, the relative mass, the relative velocity of stars is proportional to its total mass. 
The crazy thing here is that the mass I measure from the relative motion is fairly high in comparison the, to the mass that I actually see. That is, I can go and say, all right, I see you know, how many stars are in this uh, image. I know roughly how much mass a particular star has. I'll make some correction for the stars that are probably too faint. I'll maybe make some other correction for like a little bit of gas or dust in that, in that um, object. Even with all of those corrections, the amount of mass that I infer from this velocity distribution is about 10 times higher than all of the mass that I see in stars. Another way to say that is that this galaxy seems to have a lot of mass that I don't see. That is, there's a lot of mass that is dark. That is, Segway 1 seems to have a lot of dark matter. And at this moment, when I say dark matter, I literally just mean mass that I can't see. There are other observations that suggest that this mass is weird and, and isn't made out of the normal stuff that um, we see, any um, that we sort of interact with every day. That's a, a subject for a different talk. But it turns out that almost every galaxy that I do this exercise, that is, I go and I measure the mass of the stars and gas, and I compare that to the mass that I infer from the stars moving around. Every time I do that in almost every galaxy, I seem to have evidence for a lot of dark matter in these objects. Indeed, in the Milky Way, we see that about 90% of the total mass of the Milky Way is in this dark matter, it's in something that we can't see. These faintest really low mass galaxies, these satellites that we're just finding are interesting because their mass is completely dominated by mass that we don't see. Only about 0.1% of the mass is from stars and luminous things that we can actually see. And so these make them incredibly interesting places to study dark matter. Um, and to uh, try and understand the nature of dark matter. Um, and so that's something we're doing quite a bit of. Coming back um, to this image I showed you earlier, um, these newest galaxies seem to be easing this missing satellites. That is, we seem to now find enough satellites that it agrees with the predictions that I showed you from the very beginning of the talk. We can also use these galaxies to try and start understanding the nature of dark matter as well. One of the, the last kind of point that I'll talk about is we can study these galaxies using other types of telescopes and try and understand the properties of these objects. So um, using the James Webb Space Telescope, we can point James Webb at one of these low mass galaxies and try and start to understand the properties of, um, of these newest, newly discovered satellites. And indeed, um, I'm on a team, it's called one of the early science release, early release science teams. Um, we were able to get data from James Webb. We've actually proposed many years before the launch of the telescope. And in fact, so here is a little log of when data was taken. This line right here is uh, one of the newest Milky Way satellites. Um, it was taken on July 3rd. This was almost the very first science data taken with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so one of these super faint new galaxies around the Milky Way was one of the first science targets for the James Webb Space Telescope. What we are hoping to learn is we will measure stars that are really, really faint in this galaxy. We're trying to understand when the stars in those galaxies were formed and what their chemical compositions are. And so, oops, I, I, I switched slides around. Let me uh, switch that there. Don't, don't look at that, come back this way. So this is an image from James Webb of that uh, ultra faint galaxy. So of one of the new Milky Way satellites um, here. Most of the things that you see if you zoom into this are actually background galaxies. Um, so, you know, this orange thing here and orange thing there, those are background galaxies. And if you zoom in really, really close, and this image is actually up on Twitter, um, uh, there's a uh, where I, I got this from. Um, there are a bunch of small dots in here, and those are the stars in this faint galaxy. The data will allow us to, to learn when these stars formed. 
Um, my early analysis, it looks like these are formed, um, the stars were formed at the very beginning of the universe, and we're able to measure their chemical compositions as well. So really, really exciting stuff. Um, one of the things uh, I said I would mention is that um, I was actually in the control room doing this analysis, or I was doing the analysis on a floor above. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is controlled um, from a building in Baltimore, just off of the Johns Hopkins campus. Um, you're not allowed on the floor where they actually control the telescope without a lot of permissions. And so although I was working on the floor above, usually I can't get into this room. We got permission to go down into the control room. And so this is what it looks like. It's a whole bunch of uh, computer screens as you would expect. Um, we actually aren't allowed into the region where the, com the computer screens are, but we were able to see it, which was super exciting. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about um, that visit. It was quite, quite fun. Um, and so we're going to be able to learn a whole bunch about these ultra-faint galaxies um, from, the, um, from the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm actually going to wrap up a little early, but I want to take the uh, questions um, and answer some questions as well. So let me kind of summarize what I've said. Um, and then take some questions. So we have discovered a whole bunch of new satellites around the Milky Way. Um, we've gone from just 11 satellites up to 60, but now we know that that 60 isn't complete. And we think there are probably 200 to 300 galaxies that are around the Milky Way that are waiting for us to be discovered. The satellites have been discovered due to improved technology. Um, so due to digital imaging and larger and larger digital cameras, we're able to find these new galaxies. The new galaxies, if we though go and follow them up using spectra, we're able to constrain the mass of these objects and we're able to use them to constrain the nature of dark matter. The James Webb Space Telescope is, point, is now starting to point at some of these new galaxies and we'll be able to not only get better views of these faint systems, but be able to understand the um, when stars were formed and the ages and chemical compositions of those stars. And so um, a couple places, if you want to learn more um, about sort of all these different issues, um, the astronomy picture of the day is a great place to just go and um, see awesome images across all of astronomy. If you want to get a little bit higher level, um, Astrobytes is a great place. These are um, uh, undergraduate students who write public um, explanations of uh, professional papers that are being published. And so there'll be a paper published on something. It will be sort of translated um, for uh, a, a general audience um, on this site. And so this is a great place to sort of keep up on the professional literature um, in a way that is sort of more understandable. And so let me pause there, stop there, and I'm super happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, what a fascinating talk, and uh, I've learned so much. And thank you for being able to translate it for us into, into general uh, public uh, understandable language. Um, so uh, anybody that has questions, feel free to either enter it in the chat box um, or raise your hand. And um, I would love to call on some people so that we can have some interaction going with uh, uh, between the audience and, and, and professor. Um, so yeah, I do see one. Questions? I do see a direct message that I um, I can uh, read and then answer. Um, and so the question was: This is a, a physics student who learned about uh, resolution, um, and so trying to understand whether or not a galaxy is resolved or not, um, and when you can tell it um, it's a real galaxy. So um, we're you know talking about spatial resolution. That is how fine in an image you can actually see. The galaxies around our Milky Way and out to um, just kind of the local universe, we're able to resolve those galaxies into individual stars. And that's actually where we can do a lot of science. Um, so by resolving a galaxy individual stars, we can measure the motion of those individual stars. Um, we can measure their compositions. Out beyond um, sort of the, the very local universe, kind of our, our spatial resolution means that the galaxies kind of all mush into one. And so as you go out, you can start to not resolve stars in those galaxies. And so then you can still learn something about um, the galaxy. You can kind of learn what the overall composition is. You can learn what the overall mass is, but you can't learn quite as much as the resolved um, galaxies that we see in the Milky Way. 
And so part of the reason we're super excited about James Webb is that it has fantastic spatial resolution. It will allow us to see individual stars about a factor of 10 farther out in the universe. So now we have a much larger volume where we can measure individual stars and do the same science that we've been doing so far in the Milky Way. It will also allow us to see unresolved galaxies out to much farther distances as well. Um, and so the James Webb will allow us to see galaxies, unresolved galaxies out to almost the very beginning of the universe. Um, and we're really excited about that as well. So that's a, a really good question. And again, as technology gets better, um, we'll be able to get better and better um, spatial resolution. Another co comparison, here's another good question, is asking the difference between the James Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope. And actually it comes down to resolution. So the Hubble Space Telescope is a 2.4 meter primary mirror. James Webb is an eight meter primary mirror. And the size of the mirror actually directly um, it's directly um, related to the spatial resolution. So the larger the primary mirror, the finer a spatial resolution you can get. And so the Hubble Space Telescope has a particular spatial resolution. The James Webb Space Telescope has a factor of several better spatial resolution. Um, and so we'll be able to do just that much better a uh, job. So not only does that larger mirror allow you to collect more light, it also allows you to see finer detail in the image itself. Um, and so the, the difference between two meters and eight meters is just, it's, you know, it's gonna be really exciting. Anybody uh, wanna raise their hand and ask a question directly? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. So. There are um, the giant telescope um, that's in the, the southwest of China, that's called FAST. Um, and that is amazing. So that is a radio telescope. Um, and it's, I think, holy cow, I think it's 500 meters across. So like totally different scale. Um, it is a radio telescope where it is um, the Hubble and everything that I talked about in this talk is mostly focusing on optical. So, you know, what we see with our eyes, or out to the infrared, so just uh, slightly redder than what we see. Um, the techniques, sort of the technology that you use to study optical and infrared are just a bit different than what you do to study radio. Um, so the FAST telescope is a radio telescope. What you get with radio telescopes, usually um, there's a lot of different cool science you can do with radio telescopes. One of the things that FAST will be able to do is to measure gas, um, so hydrogen gas in galaxies. So from um, optical, you can kind of see gas, but you can't really map how fast it's moving. The FAST telescope will be able to map gas in galaxies. You can also measure things like um, pulsars and neutron stars and do a lot of super cool science there. And so that telescope is, um, is going to be amazing and is has uh, some early results look really cool. Um, the ultra faint galaxies around the Milky Way don't have any gas, um, and they don't seem to have very many pulsars or other things that emit radio waves. And so I don't think FAST will be a big player in this particular subject, but for other things like studying the Milky Way and studying galaxies that do have gas, it really is going to be pretty awesome. Um, but that's a great question. Anybody else have questions? Feel free to just keep them coming either in the chat box. Um, oh my or, gosh. In, yeah. Suggestions on how to get a seven-year intern in space. So I have to say my seven-year-old uh, doesn't care about it at all. He's like, oh yeah, that's what mom does. And, and he's totally not interested, which, you know, I think that's exactly what you do with your parents. Um, let's see. There are so many cool videos um, online. What were ones that we watch? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, there's some neat videos. Storybots is uh, one of our favorites right now. It's a really great science program. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Getting online, I, I wish I had a really quick answer for you, but I don't have a really good answer for getting kids into space. Um, I have to say how I got into it. Um, I think I was something like seven, actually. And I saw on TV, I saw one of the space shuttle launches. That gives you a sense of how old I am. 
Uh, and I just, I love the idea of things being launched into space. Um, and it was something that just stuck in my head. And so as I got older, I wanted to study it more and more. And so right now I'm actually teaching a, a gigantic class at, at Yale. It's actually for non-science majors. Um, we just wrapped up, uh, we study rocket science. And so the, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how you send rockets into space, what are the, the satellites and how you use satellites in space. Um, their homework assignment, which is due next Tuesday, is to write a proposal um, for a new satellite to, to launch um, that orbits Earth. And so whether that's for science and astronomy or to do something sort of more Earthbound. Um, and we've just started uh, on Thursday, uh, no, sorry, on Tuesday's lecture yesterday, we started learning about black holes. Um, and so the next couple of weeks we'll do black holes and then we'll move on to talking about exoplanets. Um, and so trying to get my, uh, the non-science majors into science, um, I, I, hopefully I'm doing an okay job there. Well, I, I suspect that there will be a lot of uh, increase in science in China in the last and in, in, in the next couple of years because of all that's been going on. So for sure, and in fact, uh, it's funny. I have a um a telecon tomorrow, um with uh folks at Tsinghua to um there's a new satellite that they're just trying to um kind of develop the mission concept for. Um, so it's a brainstorming uh, telecon tomorrow to sort of start thinking about um, this particular satellite um, and the science that it could do. Um, so I'm excited to, to hear a little bit more about the ideas and, and to brainstorm a little bit uh, with folks there. Amazing, yeah. Um, we've got a couple more questions in the chat box. Um, awesome. Uh, black holes, everyone gets excited about black holes. Um, let's see, so... Um, a couple of questions I see. So what is the biggest black hole we have ever found? Um, so the biggest black, so black holes come in two varieties. There are massive black holes that are found only in the centers of galaxies. And then there are black holes that are roughly the, the mass of our sun or so. Um, in the centers of galaxies, the most massive one that has been found so far is a couple billion times the mass of our sun. Um, I forget which galaxy that's in. I think it might be M87, but um, it, it may be a different one. I actually, just this morning, literally, uh, I was on a paper that discovered the first stellar mass black hole uh, orbiting around a normal star. Um, and so this black hole, it's not super massive. It's actually kind of light. It's about 10 times the mass of our sun. Um, but it's the very first and the closest black hole um, that we know of. And so um, this morning there was a paper finding the closest black hole to us, which is kind of exciting. Um, let's see, another question. Let's see. Ah, so the question is, um, how do we actually calculate uh, the distance between, how do we actually those, so I think the question is asking about those dark lines in the spectrum. How do we actually get a, a motion out of that data? Um, and so we can actually get the motion of stars from a single snapshot, just a single epoch, um, a single spectrum. And the um, what I do is I measure the shift, the, the wavelength at which those dark lines um, are measured at. So Let's say there's a dark line at a wavelength of 6,000 angstroms, which is kind of red. I compare that to the wavelength I think it should have been at. And so I measure a difference in wavelength and that's where I, I get the, the, the speed or the velocity out. Um, and I do that fairly often. So um, I'm writing software. Most of my job actually is writing software. Um, really, I'm a, a computer programmer, so most astronomers tend to use Python as their language, computer language of choice. Um, I teach undergraduate classes um, for our majors, um, and it's really just a programming class. Um, and so what we do is we get data off of the telescope, it comes um, you know, on the computer, and then we write uh, computer programs to measure, let's say, the shift in those dark lines super, super accurately. And so it will take me months to write a computer program in order to measure the those quantities um, in great detail. Um, I see a hand. 
Yes, let's uh, let's call on the person raising their hand, Leslie. Oh uh, well, hi, professor. Uh, this is a student from I'm a high high school student in Beijing, and I I'm studying my eleventh grade. And actually, uh, the first telescope was mentioned. And I was ac actually really uh, lucky to be able to get into your project. And the project was asking for the uh, the, the, the teenagers all over the country and to like make some proposals for the telescope and the proposal I made and I was luckily chosen and it was about the dark matter and uh, especially to study about the dark matter inside the uh, uh, compact uh, galaxy groups and uh, because, uh, you know, first is a radio telescope and the way I chose to use is about to measure the uh, hydrogen spectral lines and they can yeah. be used to, yeah, they can be used to detect the, to, to measure the velocity of the stars and, and it is actually how dark matter was first, uh, first found or first uh, getting to people's views. And also when I look up for some materials, I noticed in an article that uh, the dark matter can be, its distribution can be measured through uh, probing the velocity and flux of the neutral hydrogen and carbon monoxide lines. And, but that is the only information I can get from the article. It just mentioned it really slightly. So yeah, I, oh, sorry. Oh uh, yeah, oh, well, uh, so I just wonder if you have ever uh, heard up, heard about this saying and- Absolutely. Uh, please, yeah, would you please tell yeah, me so what, more about this? Yeah, so what FAST is measuring, as I said, it's measuring the gas. Um, so the hydrogen gas in a galaxy or in a galaxy group. Um, and you can do the same thing that we were talking about. Um, you can measure the speed of that hydrogen gas. And if you're lucky enough to have a galaxy or a galaxy group that is moving, is rotating, you can measure how fast it's rotating from the gas and also infer um, a mass and therefore, un, you know, and then compare it to the luminous and infer that there's dark matter. And so, in galaxies or places that have gas, FAST will be fantastic for doing a similar exercise as we talked about. In the, the Milky Way satellites, the problem there is that there is no gas. And so there is nothing yeah. for FAST to actually measure. And so that's why we're doing the same experiment, but measuring the motion of stars in those galaxies. And so it's super complementary. Um, and being able to measure the motion, however you do it, whether it's through gas or stars, that's where we can measure whether or not there is dark matter in a galaxy. So congratulations for getting the time. It's a great proposal. Um, and I hope the data are awesome. Well, uh, thanks a lot for your answer. And that really helps. Great, thank you. Uh, and we have another hand, uh, Lucas. Hey, Lucas. Oh, uh, hi. Um... I'm Lucas. I'm in Shanghai Experimental School. Uh, my question is, why did uh, like different planets have different speed like to move? Oh, that's a good question. So let's say in the solar system, our planets are moving around at different speeds. Um, and that is a wonderful question. Why are they moving around at different speeds? So all the planets, are rotating around the sun, orbiting around the sun. And what's super cool is that depending on how far away from you are from the sun, gravity tells you exactly how fast you have to orbit. And as you move farther and farther away from the sun in your orbit, those orbits get slower and slower. And so a star or a planet that is super far away will orbit around the sun. It'll just take a lot longer. Um, and it goes slower and slower. But if that planet decided, okay, I'm gonna just move and come in closer to the solar, you know, closer to the sun, it's not allowed to do that, but if it had decided to, um, it would start moving faster. And so the motion of something when it's orbiting is completely decided by gravity. 
it doesn't have any choice in the matter. Um, and so when you're orbiting, you have to, to orbit by gravity. And if you're orbiting farther out, you have to orbit slower. And that's actually true on the Earth as well. So if you had, let's say, a satellite, uh, a man-made satellite around the Earth, if you have a satellite really close to the Earth that orbits super fast and goes around the Earth very, very many times per day, if you had a satellite, let's say, a little farther out, that satellite orbits around slower. Um, and so it's true for satellites. It's true for planets. It's also true for stars um, that are orbiting around something. So really good question. Great, thanks. Um, since we do have a lot of kids, um, and this is sort of some of the questions that have been asked, um, you've, you've mentioned computer science, you've mentioned chemistry, you've mentioned physics, uh, you've mentioned cosmology. So for people who are interested in becoming an astronomer or studying space, yeah. it seems like there's a lot to study. Uh, um, so what, what is sort of your general advice for somebody who might be interested in studying more about um, astrophysics or, or astronomy? Sort of what would you have them do? Yeah, so, our, so for, um, for astronomy, really, it's physics. And so um, I was a physics major both in um, you know, uh, high school. I did physics. And then as my undergraduate degree was applied physics. And so it actually was an astronomy even though I wanted to do astronomy the whole time. And so um, most of our students coming into graduate school who do PhDs and then become professional astronomers um, have done physics throughout most of their um, background. So physics and math. Um, it is becoming more important and more important to study computer science as well. And so um, often when I talk to high school students who wanna do astronomy, I say, you know, stay in physics, stay in math but also try and learn some Python on the side or some kind of computer um, programming on the side. Um, because I find that students who come into undergraduate, into graduate degrees, if they know how to, um, to program really well, it's just kind of one leg up on, um, on some of the other students because most of what we do is programming. So I'd say programming, physics and math. Great. Um, and I think this is a question that gets asked quite a lot, especially with uh, a ge the general audience um, is sort of why, why are we doing all this? Uh, yeah, why are we it's a great question. All these space observations. Why are we going into space? Um, so maybe that's sort of something you want to. Yeah, tackle. So I love to tackle that. So I and I'm going to I'm going to tell a story first. Um, you know, when Einstein was publishing his theory of general relativity. So this is 19 you know, 15 or so, so 100 years ago. Um, at the time, people were like, this is totally, you know, theoretical. I don't care. Why are you doing this? And it was true. Um, you know, at the time, there were no obvious practical applications. Today, you probably don't even know it, but you use general relativity almost every moment of the day. Why is that? So our GPS satellites, so GPS that is, you know, when you get on your phone and try and figure out where you are when you walk somewhere new, um, those satellites use general relativity to make sure you know where you are. And the reason is, is because you're on the ground, uh, the satellite is up in space, the clocks on those two satellites are slightly different. So your clock on the ground and your clock in space are, move at slightly different rates. And if we didn't account for general relativity, you would be lost within 10 minutes, uh, unless you have a really great sense of direction. But if you're depending on GPS, you have, uh, you'll have you be lost in a couple of minutes. So that was uh, an example of something that was purely theoretical and sort of seemed not important, all of a sudden, 100 years later, becoming something that we utterly depend on and we can't do without. And so that's kind of a, a story to say that this sort of more you know, sort of maybe esoteric or not obviously practical research often has huge ramifications for our daily life, but it's just in a time scale that we can't quite see. And so I think that there's a real utility to this sort of pure research that doesn't have obvious today practical application, but might have in the future. And we don't know what, what will and will not be super important. Um, and so I think these sort of things are important. I also think just understanding our place in the universe, understanding, um, you know, how did stars form? How did our solar system form? Are there other 
planets out there, those sort of questions give us a little bit more perspective on our own situation as well. Um, and so I think that sort of both of those um, really motivate uh, astronomical research. Um, and I understand that there is no practical obvious thing that will come out of it for tomorrow. Great. Um, and I think this is another question that uh, I see in the chat, um, sort of connecting what is hot right now and um, yeah. sort of AI and machine learning and how, how has Let's that- Let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah, so machine learning uh, and AI. So there isn't too much AI at the moment. And so I, I AI is sort of that, uh, you know, kind of deep learning. Machine learning is um, something that we do use a little bit more of. All of my students want to do some machine learning project. And I'm like, okay, just hold up. Um, in astronomy, and I think this is true in many other fields as well, there are a few problems that are very um, well solved or good to solve with machine learning. Um, so something like if you're trying to classify two types of galaxies, or if you're trying to, um, you know, ask where are the groupings in a particular set of data. The problem with both machine learning and AI is that it can do some cool stuff. So it can say, all right, um, I'm giving you a bunch of galaxies and the AI can say, um, you know, here are some galaxies that have this property and some have this property, but it can't tell you why, right? And so it can't understand, you know, why is something happening or why have I grouped these things into two different um, categories? And so there are some things that machine learning works pretty well for, but there are a lot of things where it doesn't work very well. Not only does it not work, it actually kind of can fool you into thinking you're learning something where actually you're not really learning something. And so I have, um, you know, kind of put the reins on my students. There are a couple places where they can do machine learning stuff and there are other places where I'm just like, no, we, we, it, it, it's not helping us here. Um, weirdly enough, many of the problems in astronomy don't have enough data. And you think, oh man, astronomy, like you must have tons of data. But actually, you know, for, um, you know, images of galaxies, usually we're talking about 100,000 objects or a million objects. And particularly AI works much better when you're talking about billions or more data. And so while we talk about it, there are papers every day that try and do something in, in astronomy about machine learning. In fact, I still think it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's a nice tool, but we have many other tools in our toolbox um, to ask and answer questions, but it's, it's a great question. And I guess the last question is sort of, uh, since you are in charge of telescopes at Yale, um, so what is the difference between sort of earthbound telescopes and telescopes we're sending into space and what are yeah. the advantages? And yeah, those are good questions. So um, basically I use all different types. I use ground-based telescopes, I use space-based telescopes and they each answer slightly different questions. Um, so as we, we were talking just earlier, the space-based telescopes are fabulous when you're trying to look at the fine detail in an image, you know, and that is to get really great spatial resolution. From the ground, the atmosphere tends to wiggle all of that out and smooth things out. And so from the ground, it's hard to get really high resolution, spatial resolution images. But from the ground, we can build gigantic telescopes, right? 10 meter telescopes, 500 meter telescopes. And so those are really great when you just need to get lots and lots of light. Um, and so when I'm taking my spectra, I much prefer to have a gigantic telescope because I don't care about the sort of fine spatial details. And so astronomers like to use various different kinds of telescopes to answer a single question in different ways. One of the things we're beginning to get worried about from the ground is that there are a lot of, there are a lot more, um, you know, earthbound satellites that are being launched. There are these constellation of satellites that are being launched and you can see them in the sky. And in fact, ground-based telescopes, we're starting to see more and more um, data where we actually either have to throw it out or make some correction for it because we see streaks from these satellites in the, in the ground-based data. Um, that Rubin telescope, the Rubin Observatory that will have a 3.2 gigapixel camera, for the next few years is probably fine. There will be sort of some data we won't be able to use because of satellite streaks. But as more and more satellites are being launched, this is becoming more and more of a concern. And so we'll see what happens in 10 years or 15 years, whether or not we will still be able to do ground-based astronomy 
because so many satellites are going to be up in low Earth orbit. And so it's something that we're keeping our eye on um, and, and are a little bit concerned, but uh, we'll see what happens. Very interesting. All right, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, but thank you, everybody, for uh, wonderful questions. And thank you, Professor, for a fabulous uh, talk. Uh, I'm sure we've all learned so much. Um, I'm going thank to Thank you for the everybody. opportunity. I really oh, appreciate absolutely. it. Yeah, we, we are so appreciative. Um, and I'm going to unmute everybody so that everybody can thank you uh, personally. Have thank, a you. Good thank you. 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye.